Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to Tech Talk number 22, live from Paloma in Berlin. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, for up and coming events, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, you can find it in the video description. And yeah, for the next 60 to 90 minutes, we have Stefan Goldmann. Hello. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I brought a few pieces of gear here, so uh, I I try to walk you through some very basic ideas at the core of production in, in the first half of the Tech Talk. And in the second half, uh, we can maybe get into mixing a full production. But um, there's a drum machine here, two synthesizers. So what I'd like to show you first is uh, just some like very basic grid programming of beats um, with uh, this sequencer here, which is connected to this drum machine. The great thing about a hardware sequencer as opposed to something uh, like Ableton or Logic or whatever you want to use on a, on a computer is that you have this instant visual feedback where you can actually see the pattern of the beat like all at once. Uh, which would be here on, on this one. Of course, um, as technology works, uh, one other sequence I brought just broke down before we um, got started. So uh, I had to replace that with a time code from Ableton, which is only now setting the tempo for those things. Uh, it's not doing much else. So a way to start a beat, like, like most people would probably do is just, you know, you, you set a kick drum maybe first like that. So that would be the row down here. And uh, this one allows you to just type in beats on the fly. You can uh, go like that. And so the hi hat is up here. Typical pattern, snare drum. So this, this drum machine has those corresponding channels with um, controls for each separate sound on there so you can tune it like right away and to change the sound on the fly which is very convenient most of the time like On its own, it sounds a bit boring, um, but this one gives you the option to insert effects right into each separate sound, which I find quite uh, convenient. And it's something to um, also utilize if you're programming uh, in, in a software environment where you can actually, you know, either group everything together and have effects on like your whole drum bus, or you can, you know, separate the sounds and, and add like ad additional effects to uh, shape individual sounds. And one thing I find very gratifying in general is uh, using distortion on pretty much everything, but um, it's particularly beneficial on such a thin hi-hat as, as this one here. So if you have like this hi-hat sound, it doesn't really sit well in the beat. And you could you know, try to shape it on the drum machine itself. But just inserting a distortion unit such as this one into the head sounds directly. Changes its appeal quite radically, I think. And also the snare doesn't sound that interesting on its own. There's like not that much in terms of options how you can change it. You can do some stuff, but with an additional effect, you can take it elsewhere. Change this around. That's a, that's a play.
So you can you can use delay basically in two ways. If you make it short enough, it just um, blends with with the actual sound and gives it like a different texture. Or you can use it to create like an additional rhythm pattern out of like this one sound going in. have some lower drum sounds which uh, you can tune to to work as some kind of bass line which be something like that for instance so this can blend quite quite nicely with a with a kick drum and if you look at the pattern um, it usually makes sense to, to separate those rhythmic events so you don't have them clashing with each other, but um, to you know like make sure everything is in its own spot. So if you if you look uh, down on the on the vertical lines of the beat, you see like each event is like in its own space. Like there's the hi hat is in between the kick drums exactly, and the bass is filling additional spots. Like that, and you can like for emphasis like group one kick drum hit with one bass note, so they come together at, like one spot. Sometimes this can work well, otherwise not. But you know, just like a general uh, thing to keep in mind is um, the best way to to unclutter any any mix or any combination of uh, sounds and instruments is to give each thing like its own spot in time, and to just separate those things in a way that they work together. And um, the more separation you get spectrally between those sounds, like a hi-hat sound and a kick drum sound, if they're very narrow in, in terms of spectrum, like what they occupy in the frequency range, the more space you get to fill. You know, if you have like a hi-hat that's also like very um, broad uh, in, in uh, spectral character, you get less space for other stuff. If it's like very thin, uh, like, you know, if we unplug the distortion on this one, it's you know, it's like a very narrow band of noise in in the spectrum that gives you an option to um, put other elements without clashing the elements. But if you if you have this, and it goes broader in, in sound, like the distortion just adds addis additional frequencies. Um, you you get less space to fill for other stuff. So depending on how mm, how much space your individual signals occupy the less you need you know the more the more they occupy the less you need of elements to 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 make like a full beat and and if, if they're very thin you get sometimes to um to insert other stuff just to you know to to feel it like not too minimalistic maybe um so that's that's something i try to 
keep keep in mind is um, yeah, just you know what what ranges do you work with on individual sounds? So this one would maybe have space for another hi hat, so we can use this one. So that is our snare so far, but we can change this one to go to another hi hat sound. Now instead of the snare, we can use this row to, to have like a second higher too. So it can go a bit more in the background and fill, fill that, that high frequency range. just like a random pattern I'm, I'm putting in here it's there's not much thought behind that it's just like the second hired on its own it's not as not like not a special pattern but it's just designed to to fill the gaps of the other one so at that very basic level of a beat one thing you can do to make it more interesting is to um, to have some elements go in this like basic 4/4 frame which this beat has, and others to go in a in a different um, meter. So a classic would be, for instance, to have something to go in like th patterns of three against patterns of four. But you can take any pattern and and just listen and see if if you can make that work. So seven is a really interesting one or five, and you can then layer different. Um, patterns on top of each other. So let's try this for instance with a with a bass line we had here. So do this to uh, to the beat itself. So instead of having a four four, we can make this a pattern of seven, and go like that. Let's see what that does. So that's a very quick seven sixteen or seven eight beat, which makes it impossible for DJs to mix. But uh, it's still interesting to uh, for us as um, programming musicians to try different versions of that so let's see what we can do in terms of hi-hat with that so we also block those two
so in that there is pretty much unlimited potential in how you can create like very different structures at the like most basic level with a simple setup like like this you know where you just type in stuff you just mute some steps and you can get like very very interesting patterns out of it uh, you can for instance change it back to a 4-4 pattern but now the bass rotates in a 3-4 Addressing the most basic level, you can you can get a whole lot of variation of it, which is maybe more interesting than just like having the same pattern like every time, and um, and just trying to do everything through, through sound design, which I feel like most people producing think more about sound design than about structure. But if you if you like go to the like first principles and change around basic structures, um, you maybe get more distinctive results once you get into sound design you know the structure stays with you and gives you ample room for creating like your own structures which um, are maybe more unique than just going standard which would be 4-4 um, snare on, on the 2 and 4 and the highest in between just just uh, shifting um, the meters of like each element so you get like this polyrhythm where the hi-hat goes in one tempo and the bass goes in another no they're all in the same tempo but they go in different meters so the hi-hat has like one measure the kick drum has the second one and the bass has, the, has a third so you have this like in more interesting pattern which just keeps shifting which I find quite gratifying at a structural level have to do this with a kick drum because that makes you incompatible to other tracks and DJs will refuse to mix your stuff um, but you can use this on all sorts of elements you know it doesn't have to be um, a percussive element it can be your, your bass line set against your rhythm or your melody or whatever element you have in your mix you can think of patterns yes there's a question from the audience um regarding your gear, someone was asking what hardware sequencer you brought and if there are any other ones you use in the studio that you can recommend. Yeah, so this is um, the Genox Nemo. It's a um, German company that went bankrupt some time ago, but um, they they built basically through, um, no, they built two sequences. This is the small version. There's a big one called the Genox 
uh, which has 16 channels so you can have like s control 16 elements at the same time you can build multiple pages and you know basically control like a whole production through that thing I don't find it that practical to um, to do that with with a small one but I found it uh, very very convenient for programming beats because I can just type in stuff on the fly I don't have to you know like if you if you use Ableton you have to maybe go onto the channel where you have your snare and the channel where you have your kick and and then go into it and you know click on the media file and so on so you have this in front of you for just controlling a few elements that's amazing and another hardware sequencer I use or I used because it just broke today is the MFB Urzwerk it's another out of production um, sequencer which has the advantage actually where did I put it I think I have it somewhere right here So it's you know it's a, a machine like that. It's very compact. It's very similar to this one in the sense that you can type in patterns with buttons and lights show you what you just typed in. But the difference between this and that is that you have controls for each step. So if you connect this to a synthesizer that plays some kind of melody that you know receives pitch information or control data, where you, you can uh, link it. To, to a filter for instance which accepts CV control you can just build a pattern with those dials and it's again very convenient because you don't have to open you know like a piano roll on, on a MIDI sequencer and type in the actual note but you just dial it until you hit the note you want and you can do everything in real time and both those uh, things can do this uh, what I find amazing um, is the immediate programming of polyrhythms so you have those dials where you can set it to go in like a pattern of eight or seven or six or five and um, it's very very convenient for for getting um, interesting rhythmic material out of stuff so those are the two hardware sequences I use but you know in principle you can do everything um, in, in software it's just like a matter of um, getting a control surface in front of you and you know, with uh, software, you can still program it, so you th you can get a controller and make it work like one of those machines. But that's you know, like a tool which is ready like that, and uh, you save it in the tool. You don't depend on um, having everything in in somewhere like buried in a in a, on a screen. So that's that's the convenience of that. Um, the inconvenience of something like this, for instance, that like all those parameters you have on the sounds, you can't program them. So this one doesn't receive controller data for um, something something like this. Which would be like amazing to record. You can't do it, so you're forced to do it in real time. And if you want to program a track with that and record it, you have to sit there and do it manually, which um, maybe reduces your options a bit but sometimes reduction is, is something that that helps you get to, to a specific point which if you can record and control everything you don't get there so it's also a matter of simplifying and um, what's I think important um, to, to have in mind is that any interface of any instrument if it's your software or synths like that or, or a drum machine or a sequencer it puts certain things in front of you so it's very you know like convenient to do like this um, but if you for instance want to control pitch data on this one you have to go onto the step set the pitch for that and then you don't see it you don't know where that pitch is until you know you hear it but um, with that at least you know you don't have to have to think about it you have like instant visual feedback you see where your pitch is but here you don't and that kind of maybe psychologically speaking sets you in a point where where that's like not at the forefront of your efforts you know um, usually we as humans tend to do what's what's kind of convenient and then you know maybe we go one step further or two or three but if we go like 27 steps further we lose track of what we wanted to do um, so sometimes it's important to choose a machine or an interface according to what you actually want to achieve by it on one hand or otherwise just you know take it and l have it lead you somewhere but keep in mind that there's always something beneath the surface of such a machine mm. 
for instance, this one here is um, is very convenient in terms of having each parameter on the surface. There's like no hidden menu on this synth. We can maybe get it together with the drums. So, because this was supposed to be controlled by that sequencer, but it, it's dead. So I just put on like two random notes in Ableton going to that. So that's just like two random notes. So what you have here is just two oscillators, so you have two tones to combine. It's monophonic otherwise, you know, you can't play chords or anything, but it has two separate notes you can set. And it has a so-called um, sync feature, um, synchronization between oscillator 1 and 2 which means that one oscillator is running at a waveform and the other one gets reset by the first oscillator. So it sounds like that. It's maybe easier to hear than to describe. That's what like sync does. So when I turn the frequency on the second oscillator, It does two things. It changes the frequency of the oscillator, but because it's synced to the other oscillator, it gets reset every time the waveform of the first oscillator comes through um, zero at the start of it. So you get this kind of like metallic character out of it, which is quite interesting. And you can um, employ that through modulation to, to get it more interesting. So there's an LFO on there, which is like a third slow oscillator which you can set on the frequency of the second oscillator and change its character with that in a manner of time. So, so that's a very extreme setting. So you get this kind of like phasey sound on it. And another thing you can do um, is obviously, you know, have a, yeah, there's a filter. So this is uh, working in the mode of subtractive synthesis. That means you have a, like a quite rich waveform, which is either saw or pulse, uh, named after the shape of the waveform of those oscillators. And the idea of subtractive synthesis is that you can remove part of the high frequency content of that wave with a filter, which just has this cutoff frequency. So that filter is all open. And there's resonance on the filter, so it emphasizes the cutoff point a bit. This resonance full up. Resonance removed. So you can use this to shape the form of, of the wave by removing its the its high frequency spectral content. So that's still a bit boring. And what you can do to make it more interesting is there's an envelope. So there's one envelope on the actual tone, which just sets basically the, the, the duration of the tone and how, how quick it um, loses level. So if it's like a very quick succession of notes, you, you just, you know, get into that cycle of waveform. So it's like all open like that and you can make it shorter. And you can do the same thing uh, the same thing with a filter. There's a second envelope. Which allows you to shape the tone and make it more interesting. This is the resonance of the filter, which is almost like a third tone meshed into into those tones uh, from from the oscillators. And to make this further compelling, you can set those envelopes controlling the frequency of the oscillator. So by controlling the frequency of the oscillator by an envelope. Um, makes it move quite quickly, you know, not like tones in, in such a line, like this two-tone line, which we've been hearing here. So those are the, just like the two MIDI notes that trigger this, but you can make it more percussive by having the envelope going into the tone. Mm -hmm. 
So you get like a more percussive tone out of it. If you combine it with a filter. Now we can set the second oscillator to the second envelope. So these modulations help you get um, in getting like a more compelling sound out of it. And if you combine it with the beat, just Very, very simple, very few modifications um, to connecting those simple controllers like envelopes to um, to oscillator frequency and to, to filter frequency with the resonance. You can get like a quite wide range of tones. If you um, use the LFO again, uh, you get even more stuff you can, for instance, you can put it on the filter. You can even use that to get like a rhythmic quality out of out of this uh, synth tone. Or instead of the filter, you can put the LFO on the frequency here. Something that's that simple um, helps you get get a good feel for what interrelations of uh, those few elements do. You know, if you have a more complex instrument like this one, it has four oscillators, uh, four LFOs, four envelopes, um, effects, delay, and so on, all convoluted into one. You know, if you just, if you start with that, it's very easy to get lost in all the options. And um, I think the, the benefit of, of starting out with like very, very simple um, options of shifting your sound somewhere, like, like in this case, um, gives you a very clear idea. So this is, you know, I think the main um, didactic selling point of, of modular uh, synthesizers that you basically get like one function per module and you have three of them and you already um, are forced to, you know, you know, make the most out of each connection. You have to um, think about, you know, what you're doing. You know, like you're plugging this controller to to that um, recipient of of uh, CV data. Like, you know, you say I have this LFO and I put it to control the frequency of the oscillator, and then I have the same thing control the the cutoff frequency of a filter. So um, you get like a very good idea of what you're actually doing. Whereas with a complex instrument. Um, sometimes years can go by and just very simple stuff you don't know about it because it's hidden in some sub menu 
um, and you just don't think about using it. So that's like a, a big advantage. And um, something like this, you know, it's very, um, very good for getting like interesting bass bass sounds quickly because you only have like those few options which you can combine and uh, you get stuff instantly and you can modulate in real time or you can you know plug in some control and record your um, your your movements of each parameter so it, it gives you those options to to actually make it very distinctive but there's like a lot of chance findings which I find interesting and I think this maybe the one thing that characterizes um, electronic dance music the most is that you get this loop you know you get like this one bar of stuff going on or, or like that and um, you just make everything work within that frame you know if you if you have an instrument and you know you're, you're holding a guitar and you have you know like the next six hours you're not forced to to think in like 0 0.7 seconds which is you know the, the time frame of like half a bar so if, if you have something like this it goes at 2-4 uh, so it's half a 4-4 four, four bar and you have to, to say like okay how do I make this compelling within like that tiny tiny time frame and um, just by you know even just turning like random stuff you you get to points where you can just stand back and evaluate what you're doing so you get to turn something randomly Is, you know, you, you turn stuff randomly, and you get to get to immediately evaluate what what you're doing. So, you get to very distinctive points. Whereas, if you if you're like in an open-ended time frame, um, you might turn stuff forever, and you don't remember what you did two minutes ago, and it's very hard to um, to go back to that point. But here, random stuff can get very solid and um, can be the basis you know of, of a whole genre like my, my favorite story is um, how acid house came to be so there is this guy from Chicago there is this guy from Chicago called the uh, Spanky and he bought uh, a Roland TB303 which is a baseline synthesizer which Roland built uh, for I think the purpose they built it for was to have people who were playing uh, piano in a hotel lounge setting to have like a cheap instrument that would do like an the function of uh, an acoustic bass player and uh, the Roland uh, 808 and 909 drum machines would be supposed to emulate the drummers so they use you have one person playing piano and you know they can set a drum beat on that machine and they can set a bass on on the 303 but they don't sound you know the 303 doesn't sound like an acoustic bass at all and the 909 is way too heavy for that setting so it never worked in that setting and um, musicians who bought it initially couldn't really make it work for that purpose and they sold it off and it became available very cheaply in thrift shops so Spanky in Chicago in I think like 1985 or 6 or something like that um, got to buy this 303 baseline synth for I think $40 and he took it home and he switched it on and he tried to, to figure out what it does because it came without a manual and he just couldn't figure out how to program it uh, to you know play like specific lines so the 303 has this sequencer where you need to go step by step and you, there's this tiny keyboard but you can't play it like a keyboard so you have to say I go to step 5 and that's the note I want to hear and then I go to step 9 and that's the note I want to hear you so you have to program it and he couldn't figure it out and he called his friend DJ Pierre who came over um, and couldn't figure it out either but he found the controls for the filter for the frequency and the resonance and they basically took the pattern which the previous owner had programmed and they just went like this and they had a drum machine and they recorded it and that's how Acid House was born basically so just the movements of two controls so something like very simple if, if you can make it by experimentation, um, if you can make it to have like some distinct individual sound, you can go from there and...
and build a whole genre out of that. Like, okay, we, I didn't create a genre right now, but you know, basically, pretty much everything of relevance in electronic music came about by somebody somewhere sitting and and doing that and finding something interesting and going like, okay, that's it. And the simpler the setting, the easier it is for you to um, to be forced to to make it interesting through you know experimentation. If you have something where you have um, 400 parameters, it's very very hard to get yourself into the mental state of um, forcing yourself to select just like three things that would make an impact right there. So that's um, the you know the basics. Of, of stuff like that, uh, which makes it beautiful. And uh, you can maybe, you know, with that mindset also approach more complex machines like, like that one. Um, and maybe, you know, like many people would go and test the sound by, you know, like going all over the keyboard, like, like a piano, you know, like, so what do we have here? Okay. They go like, okay, this doesn't sound really interesting. So instead of you know going directly into the whole composition process, saying like, okay, this is my melody, and then I want to shape the sound, maybe just remove the consideration of tones altogether and just have it repeat like one tone, like like this. So you can go like, okay, this is an arp, this is an arp which out of one tone makes several tones, but basically, you know. Your hands are free to experiment. And, you know, the standard thing to do is, of course, to turn the filter. But you can just go and explore in, in such a setting, like you know, discarding the the notion of uh, I want to have a melody instantly. Just just trying to see what does this thing do, and then find an interesting spot, and then think about you know how to structure this in terms of melody or rhythm or whatever. So one interesting thing about this machine is that, you know, like a standard subtractive synthesizer such as this one, um, the typical structure it has is it has oscillators which create the tone, then you have um, a VCA, which is like a controlled, uh, think of it as a volume knob, like a volume control, and you set an envelope onto the, the volume control and this shapes the level of the sound. So, you know, you can set it, it goes on instantly and then it fades away within a specific time frame or it stays up or whatever. And then there is a filter to shape it and maybe some more modulations, you know, to, to tackle the movement of each parameter, such as uh, the frequency of your VCO, the frequency of your filter, your resonance, or whatever. This one basically has the same structure. It has oscillators, it has filters, it has envelopes, and it has a, a VCA, voltage-controlled amplifier, to apply those, those things together. But it has one specific thing, which is it has an effects section between the oscillators and the filter. Um, basically, this gives you three modes of distortion in between, and I think that's something very, very interesting. Because let's maybe find a different sound so I can show you that in a, in a, in a better way. So this is like a you know, like basic tone, it does nothing. You know, there's like a tiny bit of filter filtering on it, so you can take you know away of the high frequency content of this waveform. But um, this effects section here lets you distort the waveform before it hits the filter. So it sounds like that. It's just um, standard distortion, if you want to call that. And it has a bit crusher and an alias filter, which sounds like this, maybe easiest to, to show. So it deteriorates the waveform severely. Pure waveform. So um, that's something, and that's the.
maybe an arpeggiator is a good thing to show on this. Um, oh. What it basically does, it, it adds additional harmonic material to, to the waveform. One way to, to think of distortion in general is that um, distortion, uh, we think of distortion as something that deteriorates sound. You know, if you if you go all red on your DJ mixer, um, you feel it deteriorates your sound. But what it technically does is it adds frequency components to your spectrum which were not there without the distortion. So if an original signal, if you think of a sine wave, which is, which is just a pure tone, um, it's just, you know, on, on, a, on a spectrum analyzer, it's just like one line, that's a sine wave. And if you distort it, um, if you do nonlinear distortion, it adds additional frequencies. So it takes the energy from this one particular wave and distributes it across the spectrum and brings up other peaks on your spectrum analyzer. That's what nonlinear distortion does. Linear distortion is just um, shifts in, in your level and your phase, or, you know, like you delay a wave that's linear distortion. And nonlinear distortion is anything that um, adds additional spectral content to your wave, such as this one here. So if, you, if you then filter it, you cut from those additional distorted frequencies and you get like a more interesting sound as a result. Or just a more saturated sound, you know, there's like more more to it going going into the filter, which gives you like a lot of options to work with. And you know, if you start from a simple waveform, you want to make it more interesting. So one one thing to do, which unfortunately many synthesizers just don't give you the option to insert something before the filter. Um, I think it's an extremely valuable uh, thing thing to do, and um, maybe you know you can try to think if your instrument gives you an option somehow to to distort or to to you know like change uh, the shape of your waveform before it hits the filter um, gives you tons of options um, but you can also of course just uh, modulate the waveform you know assign some controller to uh, do something strange with the waveform like for instance like you can um <laughs> So that's a, that's a second oscillator which is synced to the to, to the first one. So that's that's just one oscillator and filter. And now we add like a second waveform which is synced to the other waveform, which means we um, reset it like every time. The previous oscillator goes through the row, it resets the second waveform, which gives you like this metallic sound, which we also had on here. And that's that's like a good option to to make to make the the waveform more interesting. And then you can assign controllers if you, to modulate that oscillator which is synced and then you know even have like a kind of flangey sound to it. So that would be an LFO to add. So that is just shifting the, the pitch of the sync oscillator. If we remove the sync, it's just a second tone. And now we sync on totally changes the sound. Actually, if you just have like two oscillators at different like regular pitches, um, I think like a lot of like historic dance music used that to have like this. So, you know, if you just... 
You know, you get like those kind of kind of sounds. It's just like two oscillators at um, at you know like distinct pitches. So one is uh, what is it tuned to? One is A and the other one is C. So you have this. Um, you know, it's basically. So, you know, just like setting random stuff gives people um, ideas like that and then they go and create a whole, t whole tune with uh, that cheesy kind of sound. So, um, it's, it's maybe good to think of something like pitch not in the terms of traditional notation. You know, if you, if you write down notation the way you would uh, write something for a piano, you think of like this is C and that's an A and, uh, you know, if the notes say C, you, you push that and that's like the tone you get, the frequency, but it can be just just part of, of timbre, you know, of, of the actual quality of the sound um, by using modulations on it and, and just, you know, like melding it into like one entity. Because I don't think we hear parametrically as humans. We hear um, the whole sum of what comes out of here. You know, we don't we don't hear like, okay, the LFO setting is this and the envelope setting is that and oscillator does, one does this and oscillator two does that. We hear like one cogent sound melt together. So those traditional distinctions of uh, pitch, amplitude, which is level, uh, phase and so on, um, in synthesis, they typically all like, you know, go into like one sound and you can you can control them in, in all sorts of uh, ways to, to shape that. Um, so the way to build an interesting sound for me is, you know, just to either start somewhere and, and change individual stuff and hear what it does, you know, to, to the whole entity that comes out, or to start at a basic level and add modulations and like different controls doing different stuff. And once you get to like, you know, like three steps controlling your waveform, like um, you have, you know, sync, then you have like an envelope uh, going to the pitch and uh, you have um, distortion changing the shape of the waveform and you have a filter and a filter envelope you get to to a quite complex set of um, parameters going into shaping a sound and you you can usually get something quite individual just with like maybe four um, connections of control and the more you add you know the more you approach noise uh, where, you know, like more complexity doesn't add anything to your pleasure in, in listening to it. It makes it usually less distinctive um, as a sound. So I don't think, you know, we have exhausted all possibilities at the basic level that we need to go like hyper complex on, on anything. Like complexity um, at some level is, I think, detrimental to your message as a sound. Um, and um, there's like maybe like the right level of complexity to hit where it's just, you know, like interesting enough, but it doesn't fall apart yet. So if you had like too many modulations, it just goes all over the place. It's just noise. Um, even, you know, if you, if you do like very experimental music, very noisy music, it doesn't need to have like 28 things controlling the frequency of one oscillator. Um, it, it just um, gets too much. So don't, don't, start out with having like everything connected and everything switched together but just just try simple combinations and um, learn like what they do and that gets you to the sound and I find myself in that process like constantly because I don't claim to understand everything I do I think that's the beauty of electronic music you don't have to understand anything you don't have to know <laughs> um, classic harmony you can just go by ear you know you set up a loop and you see like what does this what does this do in connection with that and you take it from there so going back to the most basic level such as okay let's switch on the arp again and do like some sync on again that's the envelope of the filter there's one control that allows you to assign um, the, the key which the tone is on um, to different levels of opening the cutoff of the filter. It's called key amount on this one. You have this on 
most synthesizers. So this combination of um, frequency cutoff on the filter, envelope and uh, key control or velocity control would be another one. You know, if you set those, you can you can get your sound to a spot where it sounds most pleasant to you. So, if you want to make this one more interesting, uh, one thing which I think is for some reason not that much um, being explored by people at the very basic level is um, breaking out of this structure of how tones are typically arranged in, in Western musical thinking. So, you know, you see this is like a design copy from uh, something that's like 500 years old, which is like a keyboard which you find on pianos, organs, uh, cembalos and so on. And um, for some strange reason, this is still being presented as the standard interface of dealing with an electronic instrument. You find the same thing in something like Ableton, you have this piano roll. I don't know if we can show this quickly. Um, in, in Ableton, you know, this is like the typical setting for medias. You have this piano keyboard on your left side and you situate a note in, in that framework. So you say, you know, like this, like a note that corresponds to C and the other one is A or whatever. And um, there is like no necessity to have it like that. You know, just as you have like a continuous control of the filter, you just as well have a continuous control of, um, of pitch or frequency. So you can use that by, there's no direct control here to do that. But if you go into the modulation matrix, so it's something that's hidden, under the surface, you have to go into this and there is a slot where you can assign the note number to, for instance, the frequency of the oscillators. So if you turn this up or down, it changes the distance between those tones. So like from here to here, in a traditional setting from C to, uh, to another C, which is one octave higher, um, it just doubles the frequency. So if this is 400 hertz, this should be 800. But, you know, there's no physical law saying, why you know, this should be 800, it could be 700, it could be 1300. So you can set it up to be like on one controller and then you can shift it. So kind of, kind of using extreme settings here just to demonstrate the effect. So what it does is it changes the relation between those but it shifts also the whole thing so it, you know, it would be convenient to fix this tone and just shift the distance so we can hear that but Unfortunately, it's not possible with that instrument, or at least within my capabilities of knowing this instrument. I don't know how to do it otherwise. But you can change that relationship. As opposed to standard standard tonality sounds like this. You can you know you can think about it. But that's standard tonality, you know it sounds very boring, I think. And uh, it's uh, maybe I think that's one reason why people um, object to digital oscillators. You know, there's there's this uh, thinking that, you know, like analog synthesis, it just sounds, you know, we have like richer waveforms. So this one has digital waveforms. It's um it's like a hybrid synth. You have digital waveforms going into an analog filter. So everything, you know, on that side is digital. The the distortion and the the actual oscillators are digital, and then it gets converted into analog and hits an analog filter and an amplifier circuit and uh, a delay and um, output distortion feedback stuff like that so um, supposedly you know you can use the advantages of digital sin um, oscillators on this one and um, also 
emulate analog behavior, but it sounds, you know, like many people would say, like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good on its own, you know, if you have, like, a analog synthesizer like this, just, you know, the pure waveform sounds very nice, but maybe one reason behind that is that analog synthesizers are not that stable often in having exact pitch, so if you just change the the pitch relation, like we did before, you know, like, like this an extreme value, totally out of tune, but if you just go like a little bit, you get this like nice friction at the top. So that's one way to, to make um, digital oscillators more compelling is to spread or to make uh, to make them a bit more narrow in frequency relation. So it doesn't go from 400 to 800 and doubling, you know, frequency, but to maybe like 802 or something. So there's like this slight friction in the tones which you notice and it gives you like a, like a richer sound. So even if you want to stay in standard tonality, it's still something to, to have in mind that that can enhance uh, your perception of, um, of standard oscillators. Actually, like one reason I think why they did digital oscillators here is um, apart from standard waveforms, they also have some, you know, like wavetable um, waveforms, which you can't really do in analog. Um, basically, wavetable synthesis has this idea that you have one waveform and you have another, and it just crossfades between the two, so it builds like intermediary shapes, and it's, it gives you like very interesting options to to work with that. It has a fam, so there's like a lot of complexity in that section. That's why they have it digital. But if you want to go for standard waveforms, um, think about the the pitch spread on on the instrument as a way to to get to to interesting sounds and I think like a lot of good dance music works with out of tune stuff or with not auto tune out of tune um, to to just have like more interesting friction laden sound which is also I think important to think of stuff that breaks up your grid you know like you have typically what um, that grid where <laughs> You know, like in a normal setting, it's such a pattern like that, and it's the same with using a drum machine or something. Um, you have two grids going on. One is saying, you know, like there's like one bar and there are like 16th notes, so each um, rhythmic event is quantized to be like exactly on the millisecond somewhere in that frame. You know, like no natural instrument and player behave like that. If you have natural players, even like the best ones, they have like these like slight shuffles where, you know, like some rhythmic events, even they, they keep time, but there's, you know, something that's a little bit later than something else. So um, that's, you know, like one way to make it more human, more groovy maybe. Um, and the other thing is pitch, you know, like most instruments, they natural acoustic instruments, they don't behave such as an exact waveform being triggered at like an exact value of, of frequency. So um, working with those things, uh, you can get the best of both worlds. You know, you get the machine-like feel of um, the rhythm being, you know, like totally locked in, but you can use envelopes to, to get like a rhythm into the tones, you know, like... If you use like this, it kind of changes the, the shape of the tone in time. So um, you can use this as a, like a micro rhythmic um, tool. You know, you can modulate the amount of envelope, for instance. And it's uh, it's often like a very gratifying thing to keep like one thing in real time and just go like, you know, as you feel, so you don't control like every single thing, but use that as a, as a matter of expression. So if we move away from this and just, you know, take some, some more interesting sound like the good thing with such a synthesizer is that you can save your work, you know, you can um, do something and then preserve it for later use. So.
so the idea is that you can use you know like certain points in your patch to um, keep it alive you know through a longer stretch if you just you know have like one setting and you're totally hands off it just goes boring very quickly and by you know just shifting certain things such as uh, the level of an of an envelope somewhere or or your filter cutoff is like the most standard thing you know like you just sit there and turn the, f the filter frequency and um, it just um, makes something uh, how would you say lively and compelling in the long run as opposed to you know like dead locked in and nothing's happening for there so I think like variation can be your friend um, and you just get to design the point of where you get variation you know if you have an acoustic instrument pretty much um, all is there for variation you, you pick a guitar so like each tone comes out different um, here you can set it up and you say like I want only like this part and that part to be moving and the rest to be locked in so you get to be the designer of your instrument you know you have like one instrument the way it's set up but within that you build your patch which is like your instrument and you set the points where you control it and um, if you you know you set up like a drum beat you set up a bass line and you set up like some melody and with each of those you just you know like move one or two things like you know you on, on this one just let me see so you have a beat and the only thing you ever move is the duration of the hi-hat or you add your synth and you only move the cutoff and now you move both you get to um, you know like almost built a dramatic track just by that you know you have like the super ba most basic um, stuff happening actually in terms of programming but you set like two points which you which you modulate and that can you know that can hold the track for eight minutes or something um, and so that's that uh, do you want to go for a few questions before we Please, finish yes. for tonight um, for everyone who recently tuned in feel free to send your questions we're gonna go through a few and then I think we're gonna wrap up the stream so first question is um, how do you then go from like your 16 bar or however long loop that you made into a full track do you have any like tips for for the people out there on yeah how to go from from a loop to a five minute track okay I think you know the one of the most important parts is to me is what I just uh, suggested is that um, you think of modulation of stuff so um, so you have movement and you know you can uh, build in a track by setting uh, levels you know where less happens and then you open them up where more happens so, you know if you open a filter you know it has more presence and um, it commands more attention so that's you know like a way to build up in a track is just to keep opening stuff and then you know if you close it back down uh, you know you shorten the envelope like one thing to do for instance would be what's, what's let's find another sound quickly so we for instance okay that's some just you know like just with the same sound and the same pattern going on um, you can separate different sections of a track by making you know like a dramatic change for instance in opening up the envelope or closing it so if you like this is like the basic sound you can go so 
so just you know like by some more dramatic parametric changes you can build towards different sections of of a track um, then you know of course the classic approach is if you have layers in a track and if we have time i can actually open up a session i don't know how, how much time we've left and maybe not so much okay no session today i'm sorry um so you know the the, the standard approach is in in any track which you'd program in something like ableton or logical cubase you'd have different elements you know having like their own um most generally said you know like a uh, box of data so you have you know like one midi file controlling a drum machine or, or just you know like some sounds of a drum machine um, or controlling your bass line and controlling other sounds so you know the most typical way to build a track is you go from zero you just you know you start with the, the most basic beat you have like a kick drum and a hi-hat and um you know you start with this and then you, you bring in you know layer by layer so um you have usually such a structure as like 16 bars of uh, beat uh without you know like any distinctive elements um you know just just like something to to give the dj time to mix in so if a kick drum and a hi-hat um, and then you bring in, you know, the snare, for instance, if there is one, or you bring in the bass line, so you keep on adding, and with each step you build the track. So it's just a process of, of adding and removing. Um, so, you know, basically when you're producing, uh, you're listening to a loop and you build all that stuff, and then you take away, you know, it's like doing a pencil drawing, and then you take an, an eraser and say, like, okay, like, what's the most I can reduce it to start? To start the track you know you don't want to usually you don't want to start with like everything out there at the beginning there, there are different philosophies i think now rogers of Sheikh said um it's very important to you know like hit people over the head with you know like the hook line and everything you have like in the first second so it goes like ah le freak and you have like the whole you know thing right there um you know if you have a very competitive scenario that might be a consideration you know you have djs checking new tracks and you want them to to like your new track maybe you know like having the intro where like nothing happens for two minutes is not a good suggestion but um so maybe the way to think about it is to start with something that makes it like interesting enough to want people to engage with it but um, that you don't give away the shop like in the first seconds so you just you know have all your elements together and then you remove and remove and you see like how much can you remove and have still an interesting track and then you add from there you know like you have just the beat or just like the core elements of the beat and maybe one distinctive other thing like one sound that's not a beat and then um later on you you add like another interesting element and you know you you see the whole thing coming together and then eventually you drop your your bass line or your melody or whatever you want and then you have a section where you remove it again and you use modulation to keep it compelling um which you know if you if you're working with uh pure samples you know it's not that easy as here to you know change the, the shape of a tone but you have like other methods to to make that interesting if you have like a guitar sample you know you can take different parts from the same guitar recording uh where one is like you know like more muted and the other one is more open we can use a filter to to achieve you know those like different levels of energy and engagement and you just structure them through time and from then it's then on it's like a process of experience i mean there there are templates out there we can basically load like a ready template into your workstation it's like well this is how your track should look like and now we just you know put in your elements um i don't think that's the way you should go because you uh, forego a, a good learning experience by that if you if you just go the hard route and just really build it from scratch um, you get a much better feeling of what you're doing and then you know you listen back to your stuff some weeks later and you can evaluate better and you see like well that was too quick or that was too too slow to build up um, so it's just a process of adding and removing stuff and uh, introducing variation to the same things going on Cool. Um, another question that was asked is, um, do you already take mixing into consideration when you're jamming or do you do everything, like do you do it in separate sessions or like? Um, 
what I try to do is when I have a sound and uh, like a lot of the things I've been working on in the last couple of years work like this. I take a synth like that and just switch it on without anything else, just a sequencer connected to this and um, I just try to create a pattern that makes sense in itself, you know, just which has a quality on its own. I don't think of, you know, what kind of bass line do I want to put under that or what kind of beat will this work to. Just, you know, like go with the sound and just like see where the flow of working with this thing takes you. And then I record that and s I usually record like a 10 minute session where I record like a lot of variations. I kind of went away from, you know, putting everything in MIDI controller data and building the whole track with like every detail sketched out in, in, in your sequencer, which I used to do. But I just try to get like a very dynamic take of where, you, you know, I just check the whole range of a sound and pattern where it takes me and then I just file it. And, you know, in one session I can record like maybe 20, 30 patterns like that, like over a day, you know. Um, so each one is like 10 minutes and I just go through it and then I change the pattern, I change the sound and then I record another one. And later on I can put that into Ableton and just cut out the interesting parts and then uh, put, you know, like a baseline to it which either is pre-recorded or I built the baseline to match that sound. So, but, you know, the sound itself, like the first one, which is, you know, where you start your track with, um, I don't give it much thought in terms of what else I'll add later. What I, however, try to do is to make it um, as good as possible within its own criteria as a sound. So you try to, you know, get the envelopes right, to get the spectrum right, to cut off, you know, if there's like low frequency content which you don't want, you put a high pass filter and match it to the sound so there's like no annoying stuff going on in the low frequency range if you have like a melodic sound or I cut up, you know, just, you know, to make um, all the settings within just the sound which I can make right here to make them work there and not defer them to later. Because, you know, you can record a sound that's maybe cool but not cool enough and then you say like, okay, I'll chip away at it in the mix. And there are all sorts of tricks which can do that. For instance, you know, you take sidechain compression to make up um, space in, in, your, in your sound. Um, and you can take a filter which is controlled uh, somehow later on and all sorts of effects to, to bend it and twist it. But if you get your envelopes right, you know, the envelopes would be something which uh, compete with the compressor later on in a mix because the compressor affects envelope behavior basically. Um, you remove the need for a compressor later on. So you don't have to make a sound that's not perfect in itself work later, which is usually in my experience not a good solution. You know, if you if you try to make a compressor do what you messed up in your envelope setting at the synthesis stage, um, you, you give away a lot of potential for clarity in the track. It usually ends up muddying your stuff if you try to fix things, but um, obviously when you combine things your perception changes, so there's a lot of processes which you can use to um, help things come together Distortion is my, my favorite effect to use in anything because you can shape a lot of uh, tonal behavior with um, distortion. Uh, we didn't get to looking into this, but um, for instance, setting envelopes to distortion is something extremely gratifying, particularly with beats. So you can think of, you know, like a standard guitar distortion pedal is something that behaves, you know, like uniformly. So the louder it gets, the more it distorts. But in a beat setting, sometimes you want to have very clear attacks, transients, of, uh, of your percussive instruments, such as a kick drum. And um, one way to set distortion to work very interestingly with that is to have an envelope that responds to your kick. So your kick goes in and the envelope goes the other way around. So you have this very clear attack, then the envelope turns up the distortion and it distorts later into the waveform. And you can make it like rhythmic, uh, you know, to, to have a very clear attack and then to have, the, you know, the distortion on the tail of the kick drum or on, on specific parts of a hi-hat. So you have this breathing sound and that stuff um, to, to think of in, in the mix, how you want to fill the space between gaps of tones or rhythmic events um, with distortion. So that's, you know, like a tool which you should explore definitely. Um, it's maybe even not that relevant that I show you much of it now because um, it's, it's something to experiment with. Just remember, open like any distortion plugin and try to 
output the parameters which it gives you to, to an envelope which goes in time with the sound or which is triggered by the sound, like an envelope follower would be a tool which uh, some software gives you. So that's basically the process. Try to get your sounds as well as possible when you program them or if you go in real time, tweak them. You know, before thinking of mixed solutions such as compression, EQ, um, distortion, panning and so on, just try to set the envelopes right so that the sounds work well on their own as well as together. And uh, this will reduce the amount of um, stuff you have to fix in the mix or which you have to, to bother with um, trying to get stuff to work together which is not meant to work together. Cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, last question for today. Um, what piece of gear would you save if, you're, if you could only save one piece when your studio burns down? So like what's your favorite okay, piece of, of gear? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's well, it's hard it to say. Um, you know, there's there's like a path dependent um, answer to that in in terms of what I what I used for the longest time in my life. Um, in, I started out with like two pieces of gear, which was a sampler and one multi effects unit, and only like years later I could afford my first synthesizer. And for some reason, for you know, the, I just picked one synth, and I spent almost 18 years working with that thing. So I know it inside out. I believe, and that would be the one which would give me the most options just by the level of knowledge I have developed in regards to that particular instrument. So that's, you know, not like my recommendation go by that, which would be the uh, Waldorf Microwave 2, which in many ways, if you look at it uh, on, a, on a comparison to other available options, it's not the most compelling instrument. It has filters that don't sound good, um, but it is a complex instrument. Um, you can, you know, it has like all those modulations inside and you can combine anything with anything. Um, but it has like this tiny display and so you have to go into a menu and do it. So it's not very convenient, but um, there's a, there's an option with, there's a model of it with like more controllers where you have stuff in front of you can actually turn it right away, uh, which is something I acquired later. So maybe like to me personally, that would be something to take. But if I, if I have to say, uh, if you have to put the, the question another way around saying like what would, what would be the one thing I'd recommend a person to choose? Um, would be something that's manageable, but complex enough to keep you interested in it for a very, very, very long time. Something like this, you know, it's marvelous, but it can only do so much. And what it does, it does perfectly, and it has quite more of a range than I think traditionally has been explored with that type of instrument, but it's kind of limited. You know, you can't do a chord apart from like two frequencies on that. You can't, uh, it has no noise um, oscillator, for instance, to add. It, you know, there are like all sorts of limits. And maybe you should aim at a more complex instrument such as this. It doesn't need to have, it doesn't need to be this one. It, you know, there are, there's a whole range of complex synthesizers around which um, have all sorts of options of different synthesis models within one instrument. You know, you have like traditional oscillator shapes such as sawtooth and pulse and sine wave and so on but it has also wavetable synthesis and, FF and FM. FM is something you can explore for 50 years and you'll never find the bottom of it. It's like endlessly complex um, but it's usually also very terrible to in terms of programming. It's not very gratifying because it's very counterintuitive. Um, for some historic reason techno began with FM synthesis more or less. You know like all the guys in Detroit who, who shaped techno and who shaped what we still view as techno, such as, you know, second generation people like Jeff Mills and Robert Hood. They basically began with a uh, Yamaha DX100. It's terrible to program, but it's endlessly deep as a machine. Um, so maybe get something that gives you like this combination of it's very deep in what it can do, but it's um, convenient to use. You know, it, it, it doesn't force you to go in like 20 sub menus, but it has like most of its controls on the surface and that, you know, with such a machine like that, any modern complex synthesizer, you can do everything. You can do bass sounds, you can do percussion sounds, you can do melodies, you can do noise, patches, pads, um, any any sound you can imagine. And, you know, that's, that's the one uh, you should think about. You know, you shouldn't, in my opinion, think about esoteric stuff, whereas, you know, like 
this equalizes you know gives you like that kind of low end on a kick drum as opposed to that and you end up having like a 3000 euro equalizer just for your kick drum you can do this once you need to write off stuff from taxes to uh you know like optimize your finance but if you if you care about an instrument that will inspire you forever go for a complex modern synthesizer would be my suggestion cool yeah, I think that's a great point to wrap it up for today. Just a few thank yous. Um, thanks to, in theory, for, for the stream. Thanks to Paloma for giving us the the space. Obviously, thanks to Music Board for funding this. And uh, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. And most importantly, thanks to Stefan for the very nice talk. Hope thank to all see you all next year.